What up everybody, Scuffy here, and it's time for part two of the Imperial Army card by card uh, reboot, as it were. We're taking a look at the Imperial Army card by card part two, because the collection is so big, it is too big to do in one video. So we're not going to try. Uh, part one, we looked at the Warlords all the way through two energy cost cards. Part two, we're going to be taking a look at cards of energy cost three through five. Cards three, energy three through five. And that's actually a lot of key cards, a lot of good cards, and a lot of interesting cards. Take a look at them, tell you what I think, tell you how they stack up, what decks that they're very useful in, uh, if they're worth picking up in the shop, when they're in the shop. The neutrals being neutral cards allow you to put in any deck uh as i said in the part one video that's one of the wonderful upsells of the neutral card pool these cards can go in any deck so not just for neutrals they can flesh out strategies that you uh your your basic faction deck might have a weak spot or might want to uh add more concepts to so i'm gonna take a look at set three through five energy cards. Here we go. Bernard Sappers. This card actually has uh, it's kind of fallen off the wayside here. Uh, it, it, way back yonder, this wasn't a bad way to answer vehicles or structures early on. It's got stealth. It destroys a structure or vehicle damaged by this troop. Um, the problem is, is that it's a one energy. It's a, it's a one attack, and it's a two health. Even though it's in stealth, that's very easily destroyed by an artillery strike on the four energy turn um, on top of that it's got to be damaged so vehicles that have shield um, or if it's protected by a frontline troop not as useful uh, they can still be created through the car course of using uh, Thaddeus Fail or Colonel Ornatov, but they're not something that people put in their decks. There's better ways to go about destroying structures and vehicles at this point than putting down a sapper, sitting and waiting for your opponent to play it, because once you've played this, it's in stealth, your opponent is just going to look for a way to answer it before they play any vehicle or structure. So, um, yeah, kind of an outdated card. It might still be useful in events more than anything. Bunker is not a card that you typically put in your deck unless you're building a frontline challenge deck. Uh, but there are ways to create it. It's created by Ornitoff's Barge. It's created by uh, several different uh, troops that can create it. I think one of them being uh, in the traitor faction, the Iron Warriors. You've got... Uh, where are they at? Where are these? The Adrenor squad. These guys can just straight put one of those in play. It's not great. Um, it's a 1-5. It has 5 health frontline, but it being a structure can't attack. Back in the day, 5 health frontline was very nice. But in the game state we're at now, that's really just a speed bump more than anything. Um, as I said, it's not something that you put in your deck unless you are just starting out. In which case, if you're a newer player and your collection isn't so big, having one bunker might actually be useful because you're playing against players who also are in that same uh, that same pool. So it, it's got its place. Uh, it is actually, quite frankly, even though it's not a troop that can attack, if I do get this with Colonel Ornitov's Barge, I'm not disappointed. This is actually one of the better ones to get with Barge. If I can't get the Ogrens... I would like to have bunkers instead. Uh, Kalth Infantry. We talked a little bit about the Kalth Infantry in part one because they put in play Kalth regulars, but for three energy, you're getting two troops. And that's not bad. Um, it's not great, but it goes in certain decks, especially decks just like with Kalth regulars and several one energy troops. Decks that fuel a reckoning based off of uh, troops dying, whether that is Ferris Manus. Whether that is Sanguinius, uh, maybe it's even maybe it's even Gilliman. Right? Gilliman's got the the fact that they've got to die on his turn in order for his reckoning to be reduced, but he's got a lot of ways to support his troops. On top of that, if your opponent uh, isn't paying attention, you can throw down Mysander or Wrath and Betrayal and give those little weenie guys an additional plus two as well as the splash damage of two all. So, Kalth regulars. 
not bad, very thematic for Gilliman, um, but they work well with other decks too. Other decks that are just trying to spam out infantry troops. Um, they're vulnerable, with low health, but getting two bodies sometimes is important for certain builds. Civilian Survivor, now this is kind of one of those cards that has got potential, but doesn't see a lot of play. I think it, it comes in event packs more than anything. This card has stealth by itself, which is neat. For two energy, it can stealth a friendly infantry or starties until your next turn. It can give them an escape vent for two. The downside is that two energy cost. That's a great ability, but you've got to then play a troop. So if you, on the next turn, if you play this at three energy, you can't play a four energy troop and gain the stealth, but you've got to play a two energy troop. And then you're kind of playing significantly behind the curve on top of that. She's not doing anything else for them. She's just keeping them alive. So some decks that like to make use of it, perhaps with, uh, you know, Fabius Bile, um, who's got some cost reduction cards with the Emperor's Children's card pool, such as Tactical Brilliance, as well as his ability. So while she's making other troops stealth, he's enhancing her. It's a little cost intensive using his ability and her ability, but that might be one way to go about it. Or at the very least, if you want to really protect a troop like Duke Mortiser or a neutral uh, that's going to generate value for you turn after turn, Civilian Survivor is not a bad way to go about it. The downside is it's just you're playing behind curve, and maybe you may want to consider using a Warlord who has an ability that will do something maybe not similar, but... Uh, instead of giving stealth, how about you have Oath of Weird Make give them ward and additional health? Still vulnerable to flanking, but that ward goes a long ways. <laughs> so does the additional health, too. So I wouldn't recommend picking up unless you've got a very specific deck in mind. Exorcism. Now, this is a nice card. Uh, it, it, it waxes and wanes when Ruinstorm came out, when Malevolence came out. Uh, this card increased in value because a lot of people were playing demons it's still very nice because it stuns another enemy which can include your opponent's warlord uh very useful very useful in alpha legion decks who like to you know take care of stunning things all over the place but also in the event that you do run across some demons six damage for three energy is really high that's one of the best high yields out there um possibly I can't say outdone by Crack Grenade, but Crack Grenade is a little bit more flexible. Um, but not bad. It's either damaging a demon or it's stunning something else. You're going to get value out of it. It's not going to be a dead card, which is a good thing. I don't know if you would throw it in every deck that you want to do unless you find yourself running into demons an awful lot. The good side is it's a common. Um, so if you buy the Kalth uh, expansion, you're likely going to get one a copy of these or, or two. A Goldstone Hunters. Now, this is a card, even today, it is still worth picking up in the shop. This, once a long time ago, had three health and did not have the rally. It was just straight three, three fast, unstoppable. And it was in every deck, and it never, there was never a reason not to have it in a deck. It's not in every deck now because of the rally fact and the fact that it's got two health, but it still can be very useful in so many decks. Aggressive decks, uh, decks that have troops you have to have troops for it to gain fast um troop decks that can play with uh increasing the health of the troops or give their troops uh stealth uh, stealth um stamina essentially lucretia lenari is a great example of that because she can drop them for one less she can increase the health of them maybe prior to playing the goldstone hunters she used a training cage and then that goldstone hunters is already a four three it attacks she heals it it's now a five uh four um that's one way to go about doing it or you know, fabius bile again if he's got a stealth troop on the board he plays the goldstone hunters he increases it with his ability maybe you're using something more along the lines of space wolves Lehman Russ using it to flank, uh, gain his gain his pack attack, and he's already got other troops on the board who might have ward or might be you know sitting out there ready to throw some axes. Um, yeah, Goldstone Hunters is 
I won't say it's a must buy, but it is a good buy. It is a very good buy if you are considering it. You will find room for it in probably about 50% of your decks. Eh, maybe 40%. 40% might be a little bit more conservative estimate. But really, always utilitary. Utility. Utilitarian. It's utilitarian and it's utility at the same time. Uh, Jubox Star say this is a this is just a awesome card to have. Like if you don't have it, pick it up. Find a way. Save up sixteen hundred gems when it's in the shop. You will never be disappointed with Jubox. Now, typically, he doesn't live beyond the turn. Although there are decks that can make him survive quite nicely. If you've got a Sergeant Cork. Uh, we talked about in part one. You can throw down your Jubok. Unless your opponent has got direct removal on him, you're going to get value out of Jubok. Uh, some games, there are a few games that you don't want to play him, such against uh, Alpha Legion or games where you've already got other cards being added to your hand and might cause you to overdraw. But getting copies of cards, even if they're not from your deck, they're from the enemy's deck, it's nice because it puts a clock on. Your opponent knows what they have in their deck. They know what they don't want used against them. But also, it creates options for you. It goes back to the value of uh, play on the training cage videos I did. Options are important. And any card that gives you card advantage as well as variety, it's giving you options, is worth the effort, worth the time. Even if it's just one turn, so many games are sometimes decided by what you bought generates for you now that's not always the case sometimes he can give you a dud but that is that's that's actually in the minority like generally you will always gain something useful from him for the course of the game crack grenade now this is a this is a card that doesn't see enough play it's always been around uh since since release and it's not five damage to a vehicle structure or titan weapon or two to any other unit it's a very flexible three energy card Three energy doesn't do six damage. However, it can do two damage to a troop as opposed to um, stunning. So I think that's the that's the trade-off. It's very nice against decks that like to pack vehicles, and there are an awful lot of vehicles out there in the game and in the meta right now. Many vehicles of most cost all the way up until probably about six or seven are susceptible to a crack grenade. That it's just a card that costs three energy. A lot of people just pass over it. But I mean, if you're running into vehicles, include this common. If you're playing an aggressive deck or deck that has a lot of damage dealing tactics, include this common. Being able to stack on five damage to a vehicle structure or something to other cards you've played, or just late game throwing down a couple crack grenades to do two damage to the enemy warlord is not bad it's a it's a very good way to go about it. doesn't do anything else for you but if you're playing that kind of deck that's what it's for uh, as a common you shouldn't have too much trouble getting it you just need to know i mean it's not it's not something just to pass over unless you are just out unless you've got a, a better three energy damage dealing tactic crack grenade is a good good choice now last rifle is also a very nice choice for a common this is very nice they've got a rally effect deal one damage and when these guys came out they really helped change the tie because these three health troops these three health low-cost troops whether they've got stealth or not are vulnerable all of a sudden to your opponent attacking it or for you attacking it and then playing a last rifle section to finish it off and not only did you eliminate that troop but now you've got a 3-3 body on the board that your opponent has to deal with I like the artwork. I like the rally effect. These guys go in a lot of decks, especially a lot of decks that like to fuel with infantry. These guys can just straight sniper off your your opponent's pheromones militia. Maybe help you uh, zap Kaiser Lane in some decks right now. As most recently, the newest builds that are seeing a lot of play with uh, Euphrates Healer early game. If you've got a two to three damage uh, tactic or seek and destroy or a uh, warlord ability hit her for that drop the last rifle and she's she's gone and iota iota has got that one energy ability so she can make that work at, at four energy uh, just just a good solid come and they've got three attack they've got three health i like these guys 
Legacy of Baizaz. Now, this is one of those niche cards where it's generally a tactic a lot of people don't play with. Both Warlords getting zero attack until their next turn. The draw card feature is nice. Uh, at least there's a trade-off there. The problem with this is if you're setting your opponent's attack to zero with their Warlord attack, either you can't attack or you're going to attack, take damage, and then set it to zero. And then you're susceptible to whatever it is that your opponent has to throw at you. However, in some decks, in some games, where your warlord is massively protected behind frontline, giving them a zero attack for a turn and letting all of your troops face strike them buys you a turn, does extra damage, gives you a card draw, and if you're, like I said, you're already protected, costs you next to nothing. So look at your deck carefully. If you're thinking about this, you really have to make sure you play it at the right time. Playing it when you don't have anything on the board or your opponent has more troops than you might not be the best way to go about it. Orbital Base. Now this deck is typically in Alpha Legion decks. I won't say solely. I think there's a couple of the decks that can make use of it. I really think we're going to see Orbital Base pop up a little bit more in Agents of the Sigilet decks that are creating seals. That are creating a lot of seals. This is a great way to sh shuffle your whole hand in. Draw up equal to the number of cards basically cycle it up and hope for better options now the only car that currently capitalizes on it is a uh, pale spear in the alpha legion which is doing damage every time you're drawing a card but there are a lot of ways to benefit from this just outside of that beat like i said drawing seals late game playing normal base cycling your hand in picking up and drawing uh, two other seals that you can play in the same turn and swing the tide of the game for for that faction that's a that's a great way to go about it uh warp retreat or kinza uh early early kinza decks that we're using to cycle through your whole deck to get one troop on the board for zero it lets you draw them up a little bit faster get them back in your hand that's another way to go about it um or if you want if you just have a dead hand or you're playing a build where you want to get a lot of high cost cards back in your deck and drop low cost options that's one way to go about it ravage city i would like to see this get more play honestly this does not see enough play enemy a unit abilities cost two more until your next turn draw a card it's actually a very good card the problem is it's three energy and it's just for one turn but in certain matchups it's not going to do you anything because your opponent doesn't have any troops with any abilities and their warlord doesn't have any abilities however here's some important things to note about ravage city this affects your opponent's warlord ability this also affects titan weapons this also affects knight weapons unit abilities unit that's everything that's everything that they've got is going to cost two more then you draw a card now, it doesn't double it. It doesn't make it so that it's impossible to play if they've got a lot of energy or they've got a lot of plasma, they've got a lot of psyker ability, psyker energy. Um, then they can play around it. However, it can put a little bit of a temporary hamper on it. It doesn't prevent them from playing altogether. Uh, in that case, you may want to, if you're worried about being targeted, you may want to consider Alaxis Nebula. And the downside of just as with the Alaxis Nebula is it's only for one turn. And if it's a turn where your opponent wasn't going to use their abilities anyways, then this is doing nothing for you. However, against Akinus Vertex, who has got, uh, you know, several, it's got four arms with all with abilities, whether that is pain to siege it or pain to fire it. Playing this at the right time can lock your opponent from being able to activate or prep those abilities. It's worth considering if you're running into that over and over again. However, against games against warlords such as Angron or uh, perhaps a, uh, a battle on uh, Janisha Kroll, who has no ability, this isn't going to do you anything. This is just going to get you a card draw. So you really have to consider what you're seeing and what you want to uh, try to throw a wrench in the plans of. And if you are running into a lot of warlords who are dealing damage per Tarabo, uh, you play this on three energy. Um, he can't use his ability on, on the four energy turn. Uh, 
uh, he can't he play this at the right time, late game, he can't prep his ability, or he can prep his ability, but he's not going to be able to fire off anything else. It's always a nice option. Cost him four energy to siege, so keep that in mind. Uh, sell and love with that energy. These guys are just straightforward backlash draw card. Nothing flashy, nothing fancy. They got a good backlash ability. If you're playing a game where you want to get to your deck and cycle through, draw a lot of cards, these guys can help you do it. I have them in my backlash challenge deck. Um, I've seen them in play with some some Lucretia builds that like to dump their hand. I talked about that. I think that's not a great strategy for playing Lucretia, but I've seen people do that because then you've got a two energy troop with relatively okay stats for two energy. It's going to get you a card and help you fill back up your hand. That being said, please don't play Lucretia that way. You can do better. You could do better. Supply lines is great. This is a fantastic common. I love the art. Um, draw a vehicle from your deck it costs two less now this doesn't go in every deck but there are so many decks that make good use of this card uh every vehicle deck every deck that's got a high cost every vehicle every deck that's got a high cost vehicle in it you want to consider you want to get your doom bringer out on six energy and that's the only vehicle that you've got well, maybe if you've only got one copy of it, it's not so hot. But if you've got a couple Doombringers, you've got a couple Learning Hydras, maybe, most recently, as I've showed in my Alexis Pollux video, you've got a Justice Gunfried. Or, you know, the, the Verk, Verklosh Whirlwind. Get those off two energy cheaper. That's a very nice card. It's very helpful. Um, there are some good vehicles out there that are even relatively, you know, middle middle of the ground costs middle of the ground seven energy vulture x for five or termite drive for five i mean you could do better but if we're going into the faction stuff how about if you were able to pull off one of your warded uh you know screen for six energy if you play the deck right and then he's got ward and he's going to get stronger that's just a massive beast um it is a good card it offers a lot of options the important thing to note with this card is deck construction. Don't just plow, throw in supply lines because you've got a lot of vehicles. It's okay, but in decks like the Emperor's Children, for instance, who've already got lots of uh, energy manipulation, they've got tactical brilliance, they've got self targets, they've got a lot of good vehicles, right? They've got the jet bikes, they've got Rillinor, they've got Agnamen, but the problem is, is they've got a lot of vehicles and some of them are low cost. Paying three energy, you might accidentally draw up your jet bikes that now cost, you know, two energy and they're kind of conditional with that perfection. So it might throw things off. It would be great if you got a subjugator Titan for eight, that's entirely possible to do, but just at the damn downside, if you've built your deck to include some of these other cost vehicles, you might get them two energy cheaper instead. Not that I'm going to complain if I get Agnamen for four energy. I think that's a really good, good, uh, good investment. But against something like Death Guard, for instance, who've got some very high cost, awesome vehicles, they've got Halden Tal, they've got the Imperial Reaper. But if they've got Soric bikes in their deck, maybe it's not worth the risk to pay three to get this card for zero. That's it's they're gonna overshoot. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're building your deck with with the supply lines and you want to make use of that. Now on the downside, tank warfare has a card that just doesn't see play since it was added. Give plus one plus one to your vehicles and play. It's not great. It's okay. It was a it was an event reward. I think the other card option was better. I forget what it did. I think it gave it to all your vehicles in your deck. Um the decks that would want to use this a lot are going to have to have a lot of vehicles. And quite frankly, if you ask me, and you took a look at my Tactus Proctor video, uh, he just does it for free. Like, why would I include a card that's going to put it in play where I can just have a guy who can do it automatically as a Relentless? I'd rather play troops than, than use three energy to maybe enhance one or two vehicles. So, uh, now on the other hand, training cage is actually better. I mean, let, let's take a look at this. This gives plus one, plus one to your vehicles in play. It's a rare. You have to have vehicles in play, and it's going to give plus one, plus one to just those vehicles. 
for three energy. Training Cage, on the other hand, gives plus one, plus one to your troops that are in your hand. You haven't played them yet, so that's the downside. However, that's everything. Vehicles, demons, Astartes, infantry, custodes, it doesn't matter. It's going to get plus one, plus one. Structures, sure. It's very nice with warlords who have got a high energy start turn, such as Ornitov or Fail, and they've got four or five troops in their starting hand. They've got it loaded. They play a training cage on turn one, maybe even turn two, and all of those troops are going to be immediately plus one, plus one, in addition to anything else that they throw out. It's a, That's a really good card. Now, it doesn't go in everything. Um, I've seen it played in the uh, in some Nemiel decks. And that's okay, but quite frankly, just just use his ability. If you're paying Training Cage to get plus one, plus one to all your troops, maybe you might want to consider how your deck is lined up because his ability is doing this for you automatically. And that's just, and not to mention the other cards within the faction. I mean, it's kind of overkill at that point, if you ask me. But it's still a good card. It's still very useful. If you've got not enough troops in your deck, then don't play with it. But otherwise, yeah. Yeah, go for it. Ah, Valus Brigade. I do not include these guys in my deck. I like the artwork here, but uh, these are ones that are okay when they're generated by Ornitov's Barge. Uh, they've got the two health, which means that they will be immediately killed, but they will buy you a turn at the very least. Your opponent's going to have to consider how to deal with it or eat four damage. Maybe it'll kill off a troop you know, with, with one of his troops attacking it, but... I wouldn't include them in your deck. I would rather include Boris's trackers, which are 3-2. However, they've got this conditional rally that they gain plus one health for each enemy in play. The more troops that your opponent has got, the healthier that these guys get. These guys could theoretically become a 3-8. Three, uh, three no, plus 7? 3-3? Three, three, yeah, it could be a 3-9 if your opponent has an entire board, right? Yeah. But the downside with that is, is he's got three attack. And uh, unless they've got a lot of low health or low attack troops, like, you know, um, the civilians, maybe from a from a destroyed uh, arcology. Uh, yeah. Now, Boris Trackers is another one that you can get from Barge. But it's important to note that when you get them from Ornitov's Barge, you don't get the rally effect. You just get them as a 3-2. So side by side, you'd rather have Valis Brigade than Boris Trackers from the Barge. Compliance got a little bit better recently, uh, where they added this draw a troop from your deck. Before it was just reduce the cost of all Imperial Army troops in your deck by one. But now you also get to draw one of those troops. So there's a little bit of trade-off there. It's okay. It's not great. The upside is it reduces the cost of all of your Imperial Army troops, vehicles, infantry, structures. Uh, the downside is it's four energy. And sometimes the four energy turn is really important. So if you are including this in your deck, you want to take a look to make sure you have enough Imperial Army cards to make it worthwhile. I wouldn't recommend sinking into the into it on the shop when it shows up unless you have a very specific idea in mind. Crumbling Battleground. This card is not fantastic, but it has its place. It has its place for some decks that want to do structure builds. Um, I can think of I can think of a faction that wouldn't mind doing structure builds. But also, it works really well with the recent, or I guess it's been a few months, it's been, geez, it's been half a year, uh, the World Eaters Dar, Shabron Dar, um, as well as a lot of their Rage troops. Their, their Rage troops can get pinged by the uh, Lork Squad, can get pinged by the Crumbling Battleground, and then their Rage effects can trigger. You could also use it with uh, Har. Not necessarily, I mean, a little bit for offensive, but for defensive, it gives him a three attack, basically, at the end of your turn, through opponent's turn. It's not something I would rec recommend, but it's an option. It's got five health, so it's annoying. Your opponent's got to sink a card or two to get rid of it. Um, but 
sometimes it's not going to do anything for you. Just keep the board even and speed the game up faster. Maybe that's what you want. Maybe you want a faster game. I like the animation that goes with this card. When you play it, you know, rocks fall off the screen at the end of every turn. I like that. That adds to a feel to the game. So that itself is nice. Um, but it is a very specific deck choice. Like if I play Crumbling Battleground and then the next turn I play Argus Brawn, that's kind of nice. That's, that's a nice play. That feels good. Or if I've got Brawn on the board um, and then I play, you know, Crumbling Battleground, eh, not so much. It's, it's all about timing. However, if I play Lork Squad and then I play Crumbling Battleground, now we're cooking with gas. So, um, Desolated Ground. This card. This card. Desolated Ground. This used to be an ability on a troop for the uh, rally effect for the the Alpha Legion. It was a three energy troop. It was a four energy. It was a four energy troop. It was a two three or three three body. It was not a great troop, but the effect was your opponent loses one energy. Now this is a neutral tactic, and a lot of players who like to play ramp decks have got a tool that they start with one extra energy. Um, then at four energy, they lower the opponent's energy by one. Maybe on turn one, they play Asteroid Sanctuary from the Mechanicum side of things. So now their turn two is five energy, which allows them very easily to sink your opponent's energy with a Desolated Ground on turn three, a Desolated Ground on turn four. Your opponent has energy at still at two or three, and they're up at seven or eight. Um, and that is... That's devastating, and there are, like I said, it used to be just an Alpha Legion who could do that, and the Alpha Legion made use of that because they would fill up your hand and deny you the energy to play those cards in your hand. Now you have a neutral card that allows a lot of decks to do that, whether that's Thaddeus Fail, Colonel Ornitov, Salt Tarvitz, uh, perhaps even something more along the lines like uh, Cypher, Lord Cypher from the Defenders of Caliban, if he wanted to play a certain type of build with that because he's able to choose that tactic and set that up or maybe you want to go for something a little bit more interesting uh, i wouldn't say entirely interesting but maybe malkador h to the sigil that might be a way to go because it buys him time uh you know and if he's able to look at what the opponent's got in his hand he can know that that's a good reason to shut down their energy curve i'm just spitballing ideas there at that point but i quite frankly it's not bad it's a powerful card you have to just like with some of these other cards i've taken a look at you have to know what your deck is going to do it's not something to just throw in because hey it'll be fun to make my opponent lose energy if your deck is designed to ramp this is a very powerful uh, addition to that because not only will you ramp but you'll also de-escalate your opponent and that makes your ramp even higher so if you want to go that route consider this card if you are toe on the edge or you're thinking about some other option in terms of getting cards out cheaper maybe more along the lines of supply lines or abandoned supplies those might be the better way to go about it at a cheaper cost four energy is a significant turn but the real payoff of making your opponent lose one energy that's a decent payoff a discipline master these guys are cool I like the artwork here. I like the fact that uh, for their ability is one energy, give frontline to a friendly infantry or Stardis. These are a recent addition to the game. And so far, they're okay. They're not fantastic, but they've they've got another extra infantry here that's a new layer that you can make a you know high-cost infantry, like uh, maybe a, a Shipmaster Kyra or an Ogren Sergeant. Play them out one energy later. They've got front line. Maybe that you play with an Astartes mix. And you want to give some, you want to give front line to your uh, to your Blood Angels in the drop pods. Why not? You know they've already got drop pods, so they'll be pre protected for a turn. And then you're protecting whatever wherever soft little tidbits are behind the front line. Maybe you want to play that with you know, with uh, with Ferris Banis, who is going to be playing with infantry if he's going for a wrecking build. If he's not, maybe he's maybe he doesn't need it. Maybe you want to play it with word bears who have a significant lack of frontline but an abundance of astartes and infantry maybe you want to give torgal squad who has ramped up and has like five or six demon hosts on him frontline just to be really obnoxious um there's a lot of potential there there's a lot of potential there 
not a bad card if you are running low on options you got four energy and you're looking for a four energy troop with that five health that's a very nice card to consider another good card to consider the opposite side is five attack three health is the felizian fifth airborne now they have stealth which is very nice um the three health makes them vulnerable to a lot of anti-stealth tactics but often that can be offset by the fact that if you're playing them you're either protecting them or maybe you've made them stronger via cards such as a training cage a warlord who has the ability to add health to them or maybe you've got a warlord who has a relentless and who has a relentless ability to just give them plus one plus one at the start of your turn and as long as, I mean, this is not a rally effect, this is just straight stealth. So these guys could sit for a turn or two and get strong. Uh, sometimes a turn is all you need, but that's very nice. And in, in a, in a, uh, these are a really important tool in Proctor because the turn that you get to use them at minimum, they are a 6 4. So consider that. The Legion Fifth is a good card. It's a common two, it's a solid four energy common. Ah, Malkador's Observer. I don't like it. I don't know. Draw a card, deal damage equal to its cost to a non-Warlord enemy. So the upside to this is you can use this on uh, Titan weapons. That's it. That's it. Um, otherwise, it's troops. Otherwise, it's just... I mean, you're drawing a card for four. And if you've got a high-cost deck, maybe. But you're not doing anything to your opponent's warlords so is it worth it i don't think so uh Markov's rangers now these guys are okay these guys have got a two four but if at the minimum you play them they're going to be a three four if your opponent has no troops they're at least going to be a three four if they've got two troops uh they'll be a four four um this these guys are nice these guys can become a five or six four that your opponent has to deal with for four for four energy that's a decent payoff for common, that's not bad, but honestly, as far as the four energy goes, there's two cards in the four energy pool that are the way to go. And one of them is a rare, one of them is an epic. So if you're starting off the game and you've got Markov's Rangers, that's good. When you get a chance and you get McCormick's Reapers, you want these guys instead. These guys start off as a four four anyways, but they've got backlash. If it's your opponent's turn, this goes back to your hand. This is a card that your opponent has to work around to get rid of. They have to make you get rid of it. And if you are playing with a warlord who, again, has ways to, uh, you know, keep those troops alive, maybe even, you know, Keldus Assassin has got a way to shift into a warlord, or you've got Fail who can give them flank to deal with threats but keep them alive, or if you've got Fabius Bot. And there's so many warlords who increase the health of things or give them survivor or increase the attack give, give them ward uh you know it has a pack option for against lehman ross or bulvi graybeard who's giving them plus one plus one they can snowball and get out of control they're a really good unit for those warlords because your opponent knows what your warlord can do with it they want to get rid of this troop but at the same time they want it to not have to come back on their next turn and it makes them hard for them to choose. And then you put them in this position where now they've got to shape their entire game around this early play. And, and until they get rid of it or until they stabilize it, you know, maybe they blow a sabotage on it. Maybe they don't. But the point is, is you've made them change up their plan. And any card that can make them change up the plan is worthwhile investment. Mortar Strike. This goes in so many aggro decks mono warlord decks why not it's five damage for four energy you're getting more damage than you're getting energy the up downside is it's a random enemy but that can be very easily controlled and often it is just going to hit your opponent's warlord or it's going to hit the one troop that they don't want it to hit because that's the way border strikes go i cannot tell you the number of games uh when i was playing falk for two months <laughs> you give Give an escape vent to a Tyranthicos veterans on curve, right? On four energy, you're like, okay, these guys are out. They're protected. And then the opponent throws out a mortar strike and hits those guys. And then they die on the next turn because they only have one health and they're out. Mortar strike is very nice. 
now obviously if you play more troops or you're running into opponents who have got a lot more troops more strike is going to be a little less reliable but it's worth considering if you have a warlord who is doing all the work and you're relying on tactics because this is one of those tactics that is a high damage yield tactic on turn turn after turn four energy turn five energy turn you're dealing 10 damage to the enemy's warlord if you have two more strikes that you played that speeds up the, the, the course of the game a lot so orders from terra this card is great this card gives your warlord can act again and that opens up so many options now it is not for everybody this card is not for every warlord paying for energy to uh to have loot horse draw a card and then pay another two energy i mean that's eight energy just to draw two cards that's not a great way to go about it however warlords such as corswain who has got the uh who's got his duelist strike his duelist triumph he gives him plus two so now he's got four attack he's got first strike for six energy you're doing eight damage i've shown off my sigismund deck it's much the same he also has got a way to use death's champion and do eight damage for six energy if you throw a second orders from terra in there then that's 12 damage for 10 energy so you're still doing more damage than you are uh than you are energy and that's always a good trade-off it's really useful in Angron. It is almost a it's almost a win con. Sometimes with Angron, sometimes with Karn, even uh, attacking, hitting into one energy, switching to your reckoning mode, and now you've got bloodthirst. You've got uh, which means you're attacking twice with a minimum of four attack. So you then you attack a second time, then you play orders from Terra, and guess what? You get two more attacks. So right there, just in the Demon Prince form, you've done 12 damage, not counting anything else that you've done with, with Angron. Very quickly, you can end games. Orders from Terra is very nice. It is very nice. It's a good card. It doesn't go in every deck. As I said, some warlords don't need to act again. They're they're fine acting once or acting very little night and their troops do all the action. But if you have a warlord who is your damage dealer, who is your main gun, who is who's got a way to deal damage, a high rate of damage, putting orders from Terra with a uh, with a with a Rubio, even most recent edition, Tylos Rubio, if he's created a psionic fury. Let's say he's created two psionic furies. So for four energy, he's increased his attack to six. And then he plays, he attacks for six. And then he plays orders from Terra. And now for eight energy, he attacks for 12. That's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And that's not counting if he has a third one. Um, just, a, just an example. This is a good card, but it's not for every Warlord. Rainer Squad is okay. Um... They're an early card. They still have a place in the game every now and then if you're looking to do high damage for the ability. I think you're better off using a faction card uh, more than that. But if you don't have faction cards because you're playing with a neutral warlord, they're okay if you can protect them. They've got five health, which is nice. The downside is, is this ability is a little costly. Um, it's a little costly. I prefer something like Valteris. We'll get to there in a second. But... Uh, they're okay. Smyrna's Warriors. Now, Smyrna's Warriors is, they're kind of like the upgraded version of McCormick's Reapers. McCormick's Reapers has got Backlash. It's back to your hand at the if it's on the opponent's turn. Smyrna's Warriors is more conditional as long as they have three or more units, which means if they have two troops plus their Warlord, you're going to get a copy of this card back in your hand. So you're going to have another 4-4 four, four that you can throw out in your next turn. Very nice in Lucretia because she can play these guys at three. Uh, very nice for Lucretia against like a Canis Vertex game because he's got a bunch of units on the board at the start of the game. So in turn three energy, here's a four and here's a four four troop that your opponent knows. I'm gonna put a four four troop every turn on the board, and you're not gonna be able. And the, the more energy we get, the more four fours I'm gonna throw on the board that you have to deal with. Very nice card. Very nice card. If you are going with a infantry build, a troop build, uh, if you're seeing opponents time and time after again that have got multiple units on the board, Smirnov's Warriors is a good buy. You usually only need to have one of these in your deck. There's no real reason to include two. 
um, because they they do the work they do the work of duplicating it for you if you absolutely feel like you need to have two um, maybe consider maybe consider it a different four energy card uh, or a, go one step further and maybe consider a way to buff the stats because I think really yeah they're great but you don't need to waste the slot for the second copy of them uncharted territory and this is an interesting card here because this allows you to create three random cards from the faction which is a neutral faction it's any cards that's not just tactics so i'm going to choose imperial army and then i get three random imperial army cards uh, that could be an edict of censure could be a duke mortar could be uh a mortar carrier i could choose mechanicum maybe i'll get pride of mars drilling site and gamma psi 24 choosing chaos maybe i'll get a bunch of neutrals or maybe i'll get three command bridges it's very interesting i've not used it myself i think it's maybe more useful for um meme decks or decks that want to play a lot of tactics i think if you're playing a horus reckoning deck and you play uncharted territory that creates three chaos cards that's one way of going about it especially if one of those chaos cards actually is is a forbidden library right because then that lets you create a tactic um that's what well, that's something that's something to think about um but yeah it's not it's not something that you use to to influence the game it's something that you're kind of using like if you don't have jubak i guess if you don't have a jubak or kaiser lane it's kind of like the poor man's version it's going to give you some options, but you don't know what you're going to get. It may not be great. It may not, but you, at least you have some choice over what type of faction you're getting. I talked about Velaterris a little bit here. Here's the trade-off. So this guy's a 2-5 health. This guy's a 3-4. So one less health, one more attack. He's got a 4 damage ability for 3, but this guy's got a 3 damage ability for 1. It's a lot cheaper. The downside is it's a non-warlord enemy, so it's only going to hit uh troops or titan weapons it's not going to hit warlords whereas rainer squad can hit warlords so keep that in mind i do like the Terrace. i like parking them behind sergeant cork or another frontline troop if i'm doing a lot of infantry troops um i want to have some sort of suppression he can this three damage this three damage is lethal to a valisian fifth airborne even though they're stealth because it's random so he doesn't have to target it if they if that's the only troop that they've got down your velaterris will take care of them very quickly eritan are we in the five energies did we get to we get to five we did three we did three we did four we're in the five energies guys this is this is the uh this is where a lot of the pieces come into play the five energy turn <sighs> this is classic artwork but eritan is Okay, I have it in, in a few of my neutral decks because they don't have a hard removal option. This isn't the best hard removal choice for them, but it is useful in the fact that it is going to stun an enemy, deal at least four damage because it's the Warlord plus however many troops you've got. If they just got one troop, that's four damage. If they've got a Titan and it's a full Titan board, this is almost going to wipe out an entire titan arm not to mention stun it which is cool however that's not really the upsell i more or less use this for getting rid of six to eight health cost troops late in the game play five energy you stun it does a lot of damage and then you follow it up with other tactics that do damage um dracosan transport pass not great it's a five energy vehicle that has a activated ability that puts in a las rifle section the problem is when you're putting a 3-3 you're not getting this rally effect you're just getting the 3-3 so you're paying two to put a 3-3 on the table but not with frontline not with any other effects it's not great duke mortar on the other hand is very good talked about uh in the part one video what some options are in terms of how impactful he can be if you get him out with an abandoned supplies another great play um is getting him out with the uh the emperor's children and a tactical brilliance um salt you know salt harvits can get him out for one turn earlier or if you happen to play abandoned supplies and gotten him for three get him out the next turn for cheaper 
or for free if you really want to get crazy with it. Um, returning another troop to your hand, even though this costs three energy, this is such a powerful ability. He's got seven health. Basically, your opponent has forced to deal with it. Once he hits the board, unless it's late game or your opponent has no troops, in which case they're just going to deal with a, a very strong troop for seven. Um, they've got to use Amalgator. They've got to use hard removal because they know that if they put anything substantial that they want to stay down, you can very easily throw it back up in their hand and continue to play your game as if nothing happened. So that is a huge threat. At the very least, he's a 4-7, which is a very nice stat card. If you happen to have played Training Cage before you play him, now he's a 5-8 and he is immune to Ambassador Melgator. It's a very nice play. You can also make very good use of him in Kalf with Marius Gage. Um, drawing cards, get a whole bunch of cards up to draw. Play him on five energy. You've got Lek Logos Lecturic gives him plus one, plus one, as well as all the other troops that you've got, not just your Astartes. Uh, or maybe, maybe you want to give him, uh, maybe you want to give him Ward to make him harder to, to, to get rid of. So you've got Oath of Weird Make. It's a little costly. It's seven energy. Talked about how Fail can make use of him at ten energy, giving him flank. There's a lot of ways to go about it. Maybe you just want to keep him alive and give him stealth. You give him survivor, give him, you know, precognition. Precognition with the new counterattack from the agents of the Sigilet. There are a lot of options. Melgator goes in a lot of decks. He doesn't go in every deck, but he goes in a lot of decks because that ability is so strong. His stats are very good. Uh, he is a threat. He's a very good five cost troop. Arguably, as a legendary, he should be. Arguably, he is the best five-cost troop for the Imperial Army faction. Edict of Censure doesn't get played enough. It can ruin games, and at the same time, it can do nothing for you. Um, it returns all tactics in both players' hands to your deck, and then you get a draw card. Your opponent doesn't. In some instances where you're playing Perturabo, you're playing Angron, you're playing Jagathai Khan, this is going to ruin your opponent's hand. Whether you play it at 5 energy or you wait to like 7 or 8 energy. Uh, Alpha Legion, there goes their hand. Most of it, if they're playing with to get you drawn up and, and play off the uh, the harrowing. The downside of it is, is all those tactics go back to their deck. And your opponent could very easily, and often does, top deck a card that you just got out of their hand. And that's really annoying and frustrating. 5 energy... As I said, that's the turn that everything starts to happen. And Edict of Center is a very powerful card, but it also costs five energy. So that is a problem because you're giving up that turn. If you play it on five energy, you might want to play it at eight or nine energy. But if you play it at five energy, you're giving up that turn to gamble and hope that you're getting a lot of tactics out of your opponent's hand. And if you play it and you don't see any cards go out of their hand, that is probably one of the worst feelings that you can get when you're playing the game. It's just that sinking feeling. You're just like, that's awesome. This card did nothing for me. Um, so play at your own risk. However, this is a very strong meta choice. And if you have got a deck that can operate with troops and Warlord abilities just fine without tactics, there's no reason not to consider including it because you don't get penalized for it if you don't have any tactics in your hand. You don't lose anything. And if your opponent loses only two or three tactics, you still have caused some delay to whatever they want to do. And you've you've suffered nothing from it. So um, is it worth picking up in the shop? No. I would say, I mean, if you've got the gems and you want to include it in your deck because you're running against some of those warlords that I mentioned, sure, go for it. Duke Mortar is definitely worth the 1,600 gems. Absolutely. Edict of Censure, it's hard to say. It's really up to player preference, I think, at that point. Firewalkers. Yeah, these guys, now these are not bad. They've got the Rally plus 1 plus 0 to adjacent units this turn. They used to have Stealth, and that they were they were included in many, many decks. They no longer have stealth, but they still have the rally, and that's okay. I like the old school artwork, the old school Sentinel stuff. Um, they're all right. They're, they're, they're decent statted. I think be, once they lost stealth, though, they really kind of... People have, have migrated to other cards, whether that's a cheaper Felizian Fifth Airborne or 
legion troops or you know other tactics that increase your your opponents your warlords attack troops that do that in some factions i wouldn't consider packing them in my decks like i used to but if you don't have any other options and you've got a warlord who has got sneak attack or a conrad curs that wants to you know stay in night hunter and gets the three attack on him it's a way to go about doing it eventually you might get apotheosis and then firewalkers would go out the door Hannon's Warders, these guys are okay. Uh, they're high cost for their stats, but the really the rally effect is what you're getting. Deal four damage to random enemy. Um, now these guys are really cool if you can juggle them in some decks. And I've tried a few builds just for the memes way back when. I made I try to make something with the Underverse and get them back in my deck, reduce their cost to zero, warp retreat, um, and try to cycle. Try to cycle the mortar squad over and over and over again and i made it work a couple games and it was fun but it was a lot harder to do um, their damage is random it's not a huge payoff it's four damage it's decent enough to kill a troop or make your opponent's warlord mad um but it's it's not great now if you're playing a deck that is doing damage if you're playing a captured mandragorax uh or titan build uh, maybe you want to have a um, a warlord who is just spitting out damage every turn. Karn, Shabardar, uh, maybe you've got Perturabo. Without too many troops, but just have one or two in there for the ability to deal four random damage. Okay. That four random damage can take care of the Felizian Fifth Airborne that's in stealth. It can take care of a four health Velotaris, or just throwing out examples there. Uh, there's a lot of things with four health that it can take out. It's not bad, but at the same time, when your opponent plays it, you're kind of like, eh, okay, not not huge because once it's on the board, it's just a two four, and it's very easy to deal with. Jewel of Ultramar. Now, I've seen this played once or twice with some decks that were making use of trying to play uh, Emperor's Wrath. Emperor's Wrath, which is got to play Astartes that cost four or less, that will actually target. Astartes that have had their cost lowered by one as a result of Jewel of Ultramar. So that's kind of cool because then all of a sudden you're getting five energy Astartes with drop pods played out there. That's that's neat. But that five energy turn is very uh like I said, that's that's where things come together. So you have to be willing to give up something. I would not play two of these in a deck. That's too much. If you want to reduce the cost of your of your infantry that much and you have a lot of imperial army infantry the compliance is the better card but if you have a stardis that you're looking to reduce the cost of and you really want that and you don't have any other ways to go about it jewel Voltramar is okay this is more often now in event drafts than anything else and i think you just get it because you got two other cards that you really wanted Joker Company, these guys are great. Uh, even though they used to be a 5-5 five, five, and now they're a 4-5. Um, their resolution, they, these guys are just a solid anti-stealth card. Much, much of the stealth units, as we saw with Felizium Fifth Airborne, um, Bernard Sappers, have got three health or less. Now, there are a lot of higher cost stealth cards that you can't do anything about. they got five or six health. Okay, that's fine. But Joker Company can eliminate a good majority of those stealth troops. Acratrez gone. Firewalkers taken care of. A lot of the uh, the Night Lord stealth units. The first talons. The recon claws dead. Um, you know the uh, Andrew Sheck almost dead, and now he has to he has to act, or he'll he'll die the next turn. Um, Night Rappers who come in and go stealth, they're all dead. You can't go wrong if you're looking for anti stealth and you're playing troops. You can't go wrong by having Joker Company in your deck. And at the very least, guess what? You have a four or five body on the board. That's 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 a good card. It is a good card. I like it. Manifest Destiny is worth buying over Edict of Censure because Manifest Destiny you are more likely to use in more decks. Given your Warlord Survivor 5, once this card came out, this really, I'd say just opened up a lot of options, but it made a lot more things possible. It made games not just 
what you see is what you get. Late game, if you throw down a Manifest Destiny, your opponent's calculating lethal, and they've got stuff in their hand, they're like, okay, I, and then you throw down Manifest Destiny that throws all their plans out the window, because now you have added Survivor 5 to the mix. That's not just 5 additional health, that's now they have to trigger your Survivor, and then do 5 damage. That That's a different calculation altogether. Throwing Manifest Destiny on Karn, on Sigismund, on Corswain, those aggressive warlords, Ag Angron, I mean, it gives him more time to get to his end game scenario it protects him and it is a good card it's a good card on non-aggressive warlords too warlords that just want to stick out a little bit longer uh if you've got a warlord who you're like ah, if i just had five more health every game i'd be good to go that's why some cards some warlords out there who have got the start with survivor five that's a nice feature but if you gave numian an additional survivor five or vulcan Vulcan loves it. He's already got Survivor 5. His record gives him Survivor. He gets another 5 Survivor from that. Um, it's a good card. It doesn't change the tide of battle, but when you play it, your opponent has to recalculate their endgame strategy, and that is forcing them to react to what you've played, and that's important. Missile Battery is a meme. We, we joke about it a lot on the Discord. Uh, don't play this card. I mean, if you want to play it for a use energy challenge, go for it. It deals five and stuns a non-warlord enemy, so it can it can stun and deal damage to Titan arms. But five for five for a two seven that costs five energy to play, you're not gonna do that. You're not gonna do that. Port Maw. No, don't buy this card. Don't Port Maw is worse than Crucial Choice. And as I said in part one of the Imperial Army card by card, I don't dislike Crucial Choice. I think it's actually better than a lot of people think. Port Maw, though, costs five energy, and every turn is going to create a random Imperial Army tactic in your hand. On the surface, that sounds really good. However, as we've seen, there are a lot of niche Imperial Army tactics not necessarily ones that do anything for you or do damage for you. And they're not ones that I would want to randomly create. Um, the best ones, like in terms of random card creation, Crucial Choice, Lecticio, Remembrance Order, Ricochet, Sabotage, Abandoned Supplies, Angelic Presence, I'm going to pass over all these because Crack Grenade is good. Mortar Strike is always useful. Manifest Destiny is useful. And then you get into the high cost cards, maybe Ornitov's Barge. There are, majority of the tactics are niche and very specific. And you have put a card in your deck that is going to create something randomly. And it's not something that you can bank on. So I dislike this card. It is not good. Pass. <laughs> Pass on it. Um, and then last but not least, five energy. Sadix Fighters. As for stats, these guys are good. Five five, but I've I'd never used their ability to create a copy of this troop in your hand. They're like a they're like the rare upgraded version of Smirnov's Warriors. But they're not as good because why not just attack for the five five? I guess if in some decks, like if you played Ornitov and you give them frontline and then you have them create another one that makes them frontline i guess that's probably the best thing that you could hope to do with it but otherwise you're likely just going to attack for five um they're okay they're not something that you'd want to add to your collection and go out and spend gems on but if you pick them up and you need a five cost troop and you don't have joker company and you don't have duke mortature then those guys are your next best thing that is it that is that is part two of the imperial army card by card we've gone through cards energy three through five part three we're going to finish it up we're going to get through cards energy six through ten be a little bit shorter just as many I'm good. 
just as many good cards at the tail end of the neutral faction for the Imperial Army as well. Uh, looking forward to getting that video out here probably within the next week or so. So, that's it guys. I hope some of this has been useful. I hope you have gotten inspired to use some of these cards or to look at some of these cards a little bit differently. I think some standouts from this section, outside of the legendaries that I talked about, I would have to say Supply Lines is a great card. Training Cage offers a lot of options. The Lysian Fifth Airborne. And then I'm definitely going to have to say Joker Company. Manifest Destiny is up there too. That's a strong, like, it's a legendary though. So I said no legendaries, right? Joker Company is very good. Um, that's for me, guys. Until next time, keep playing Legions, and we'll talk to you later.